Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Mission Control. This is a podcast focusing on executive directors and nonprofit leaders and how they strive to make positive impacts in their community. I'm your host, Paul Schmidt, co owner and creative video strategist for Introduce Multimedia. And I would like to welcome to the program Rachel Swedberg of CASA. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It's fun to be here. All right. So, First of all, before we get into the mission, like I normally do, what does CASA stand for? Stand, yeah, stand for. Yeah, good question. CASA stands for Court Appointed Special Advocate, which still doesn't really tell you a whole lot about CASA. Um, But in layman's terms, uh, Court Appointed Special Advocate is a volunteer that works within the court system and advocates for a child or a sibling group. Great. Okay. See, that's a good preface. So... Um, what is, since the, the name of the show is mission control, what is the, what is the mission that you have to control? So our mission is to equip and train those volunteers to be able to advocate well for children and their families when they're in the child welfare system due to abuse or neglect. Now, have you heard, have you have, Excuse me. Have you heard of CASA prior to coming to CASA? I had not. Oh. And so what was your, what was the experience going in? What was like, what did you, why did you want to be part of this organization? It's a really good question. When I came to CASA, I had been working in the field, doing direct service work, working with survivors of human trafficking, domestic violence, sexual abuse um, for many, many years. And I had realized uh, through working through all of those different avenues that I really had a gift for leadership and that I really wanted to start focusing more on how we could support the staff so that then they could better support our communities and what that dynamic looks like. So when I actually found CASA, I was going back to school to get my master's in public administration with an emphasis in nonprofit management. And transparently, originally, what attracted me to CASA was that I hadn't heard about it. It seemed like a relatively small organization. And I thought this would be a really good engagement, a mission I align with, always interested in advocating for children and their families, but also a smaller organization that I could potentially not have a huge lift at. Ha ha ha. A year later. (laughs) Oh, that's funny. Well, because the other aspect to the, to the situation of going into CASA and um, what you what you've actually involved yourself with there was the fact that you started in March of 2020. I did. I started in March of 2020, um, really in a huge growth time period for CASA. So CASA has been around for about 30 years here in our community. It was established in the 70s in Seattle, and it's actually a national model that covers all of 50 states, I believe, maybe 49. Don't quote me. Um, And really, it was a very small, it served two very small communities, Barrie and Eaton County. So it was a smaller nonprofit, really solid mission, very solid programming, executing and doing that well. And then we had an opportunity to expand into Ingham County, which is a substantially larger county with a lot more unique and different service needs than the ones we were currently needing to meet. And so when I joined, I joined as the Ingham County supervisor and helped us transition from serving under one judge to serving under three judges in uh, a less than a year in the middle of a global pandemic. My first day was actually the day the stay-at-home orders were ordered by the governor. I was sitting in the office trying to get my bearings and they were like, okay, everybody go home. And um, yeah, so the job that I thought was going to be kind of a nice landing pad to get my feet under me and start really uh, focusing on school ended up really becoming a huge focus for me. and, And my passion for the mission has really grown from that. Well, I mean, I think that's very interesting. I mean, because you're coming in as a brand new employee um, in the midst of a global pandemic. Yeah. I mean, what was running through your head? Did you feel like, oh, am I 
just going to lose this position? What I mean, what were the what were some of the feelings that you had at that point in time? Uh, you know, this may say a lot about my personality. It's a great question. No, it never crossed my mind that I might lose the position. Um, <laughs> I thought, wow, what a cool opportunity. Because when I came in, we were working to expand, to grow, to increase the number of volunteers because the volunteers are our primary service provider. And our whole work was done in the courtroom, meeting the volunteers. We would meet with the volunteers to do the court reports. We were still doing handwritten monthly logs and a lot of pieces that were very uh, traditional, but not equipped to our current state. And so especially with the pandemic kind of making that transition and a need much faster, I thought, cool, I get to do a whole bunch of projects. How am I going to make this work? in this brand new system. And so I was actually able to really kind of get in on the ground floor and help laying the foundation for adapting a lot of our system internally to be able to meet the need. We started using online programming, Google Drives, and and pieces to actually be able to communicate more consistently with our volunteers, which increased our advocacy efforts, also keeps you more in the know about what's going on. And Really, um, now that's even laid the foundation where we've been able to move forward and, and get into our own programming for called Optima, which is recommended by National CASA for CASA programs that really allows us that real time data collection, data entry and management, which, yeah, when we started, I, I was getting handwritten notes from the volunteers saying this is what I did today. And, and now we're able to have you dictate that into your phone. Uh, which is just such an incredible difference in, in a very short amount of time. And while there were huge challenges with COVID, I think it did really force us to get creative and figure out how to adapt. And I think a lot of us might not have adapted if we hadn't had that push to do that. Well, that, that's interesting to me is the fact that, um, you know, you're, you're a volunteer heavy organization so all that communication all that just didn't stop people didn't feel like they were in limbo I, I mean talk to me about the the like the atmosphere in the room there yeah actually I would say it, it actually increased because we saw that need and so myself and one of our other supervisors we started meeting weekly with our volunteers and we just had a weekly lunch meeting where we brought all sorts of different educational topics we did an entire bias education series we did a huge self care series especially in tandem with healthcare and all that was going on with covid and we actually increased our connection with the volunteers during that time so much so that Honestly, I think it's been somewhat hard to, to transition back to the hybrid state that we're in because we don't have the capacity to do those weekly check-ins, those weekly videos that we used to, especially as we continue to grow. Uh, and so then now we're trying to figure out, okay, how, how can we still maintain that connection with increased workload, with having to be more in person? And, and what does that look like? I, I talk with a lot of other directors. I have to color code my, my calendar because it's like, okay, is this one on Zoom or is that one in person? And I got so bad at not needing to put any meeting time in between my meetings that uh, mm. now I, I have to make sure I give a little buffer if it's in person because it is it's it's almost a skill that that not necessarily lost but that we hadn't had to do as much and so now we're really trying to transition back into how do we maintain our virtual connection because I think uniquely we were able to actually increase our connection with our volunteers during the pandemic because it allowed us to slow down in a lot mm. of aspects. It allowed us to refocus. Remember that our primary role is to train and support our volunteers to do their mission. And so we were able to do those weekly chats. And in addition to the weekly chats, each supervisor has you know, 15 to 30 volunteers that they're supporting. And so then they were able to do individual calls and, Again, the timeline of that compared to meeting people in person is, it's different. And so when you're looking at those numbers, we've had to really intentionally look at how we're going to do this going, going forward so that we can support our people that really enjoy the remote and the online connection, but also those who need to do so in person. That's amazing. I mean, it just, uh, and so that, that just, that just, boggles my mind is the fact that it seems like you 
really took um, the obstacle of the pandemic and made it your own in such a way that it was hard to transition back out of it. That's a, that's incredible. That's a, so, so now, all right. So you started in March of 2020 pandemic. Woo. Yeah. Now towards the end of it, you transition again into the role of executive director. Talk to me about that. You know, I, I had been working towards it. So in a lot of ways, I felt very ready and very equipped. um, But it also was not the timeline I was expecting. Um, Finding out that our previous director had decided to retire and move on to really focus on some other aspects of her life. I was going, okay, I know, I know that I should apply for this, but I'm not even done with my degree yet. The plan was finish the degree, then go get a job similar to this. But it was an opportunity and uh, a mission that not only do I really resonate with, I really have uh, cultivated and connected with the staff here, especially over those years of the pandemic. And with my primary focus wanting to be how to support staff and volunteers to do the work that they do in the community, it felt like it wouldn't be in alignment with my own values to not apply, uh, particularly when staff and volunteers were asking if I was going to. And so... I said, okay, I'm going to do it. I'll apply. Um, And I think there's always the benefit of being an external internal candidate as opposed to an external candidate of, I knew a lot of what I was getting into. um, But sometimes I can, you can have blinders because of that. And so I, I learned a lot in my first six months. Um, I had a lot of ideas about what I would need to do when I came in and I was right about some of them and I was wrong about others. And so really learning how to take a step back and um, adjust accordingly with that was was really a big part of my learning process. Um, And I was also really lucky. My board and some of our volunteers worked together to secure a a mentor for me who provided free leadership mentoring, was also wrapping up my degree. So I was in a in a learning sphere where I was learning a new role and had a lot of tools and educational supports helping me do that. And so the transition was long, um, but, but I think very, very effective and really helped me kind of come into who I wanted to be in that organization and which then flows into how the whole organization functions because that leadership and that culture is really set with that. So, Um, you know, coming off the heels of all the, the, the shifts and the changes that you made during the pandemic, what were going, when you took the role or on as the executive director, what were some of the things that, or what was the main thing that you wanted to tackle first? The main thing I wanted to tackle first was the culture, because our whole mission um, really revolves around the idea of stability, safety, permanency for kids and their families. And and when you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, when you think about our base needs, those are really those, those core factors that we need in order to be a successful organization and in order to be a successful individual. And so I really looked at the whole organization as a whole and said, okay, I have to have these things for the organization so that we can provide this service to the community because you cannot provide something that you don't have yourself. And while we have a long history, we had a lot of great programming and pieces established between COVID and some transitions in legislature with the Victim of Crime Act, VOCA, we had lost some funding. We had lost some opportunities. And so I knew I need to look at, at the sustainability of the organization, particularly from a financial aspect, but then also the safety and the permanency for staff and like a lot of those who work in child welfare, we have a lot of turnover uh, in both our volunteers and our staff, although we have seen those numbers increasing. And beyond that, we had staff who had just gone through a transition. Anytime you have a new leadership turnover, there is going to be destabilization, even if it is done very well. And so 
really knowing that those three factors were the focus of our organization for those we we advocate for, we have to then have that internally on an individual level for staff and then as an organizational level. So those were kind of my three focuses. So I want to get to permanency for our organization. And to me, the way to do that was to make sure the staff felt safe. So shifting culture, making sure that there is accountability, but also support and empowerment and and the right um, steps taken to make sure that the staff feel heard, that they have their needs met, and that they're able to then provide that to our volunteers so our volunteers can provide to the community. And then, of course, the sustainability aspect and the having the financial means to be a permanent fixture in this community. Well, speaking of being a permanent fixture, I mean, there's, there's a, you know, you mentioned at the top of this interview that Casa was in um, Eaton and Berry, and then Ingham was added later on. However, uh, were you were you based in those two counties, but now that are headquartered in Ingham, and how is that transition? If that's the case, good question. I would say. <sighs> Our headquarters is technically now in Ingham County. It was when I came in simply because of the size of Ingham County, um, but it also also has to do with where the staff are located. And so I almost don't feel like we have a headquarters now because we've really intentionally looked at talking about that supportive staff, talking about making sure staff are safe and, and we have permanency and, and are lowering retention. We know from what we saw happen in COVID that remote work is a big draw. And so I knew that we needed to keep a capacity of remote work for our staff. We knew from the pandemic that we could do part of our job remotely, but not all of it. So looking at what that looks like, we really are working on having a a model where there is no headquarters. We rotate our three offices and we do our staff meetings once a month in different offices. We really want to be a part of each of the communities we're in and we're aware that each is so unique. And so we can't do that without engaging in the community. And so we'll intentionally do lunches in different communities, attend different events as staff or part of the staff. And then with working remote, that is a whole other office in a sense that we really have multiple offices and I'm always hesitant, although technically, yes, I would say Lansing is our headquarters. I really am hoping that we'll continue to be able to just be mobile because most of our work is in the community. We don't actually need a desk or an office to be there. Most of my work, um, my development coordinator's work is in the community, connecting with individuals so they can learn more about CASA and to ensure that we have that financial support. And then most of the program staff work is working in homes with children and their families to ensure that we know them so that we can best advocate for their needs. And so really, in a lot of senses, I think sometimes it's easy to get, once you have an office, to be there, to get stuck there. And so I tell my staff, if you're never here, that's great, uh, as long as you are out in the community. So we consider our in-the-community work um, in-person work as much as we do in-office work. So really that's what our model looks like now. And I think I think it's really freeing and it allows us to better pivot because who knows what will happen in the next five years um, as our community's needs change and grow. And speaking about the community and the fact that we started with what what is CASA, is that been kind of like a... Uh... I don't want to call it an obstacle, but is it is is it kind of a hindrance a little bit with with your name and what it means and what people attribute could potentially attribute it to? Is that an, uh, a situation you have to face by going out into the community when you go out into the community? Absolutely. I would call it an obstacle. We've actually done two <laughs> strategic planning sessions, one for marketing specifically and one for our entire organization just within the last six months. Um, and all of the data pretty consistently showed across the board that uh, not a high percentage is aware in our communities of CASA. We had, I'm working with MSU Street Teams, which has been an incredible experience, and they surveyed um, a huge amount of our community, and only 15% of our community knew what CASA was offhand. And so that's that's a big obstacle, um, especially when some some 
titles, some organizations' names do a great job of telling who they are. Um, ours does not, and it is a national model, so we do need to stay with it. And so being aware of how we can address that and ensure that we're being clear about that, working on our community engagement, working on our marketing so that my goal is that CASA will be a household name and people will understand in our community what CASA means. And that I think is really the nice thing with an acronym, even though it is a bit of a confusing acronym, is once you know it, it does stick in your head. So -hmm. those who know us know us. It's actually amazing to me how often we'll have volunteers that will come back and become a volunteer and they'll say, oh, I learned about CASA 10 years ago, but I wasn't in a space where I could do it. So I am now. Once people know and know that acronym, I think it does stick. It's just overcoming that initial obstacle. Now, um, so with that, with all the, 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 uh, like you said, you're going through a a marketing strategic plan, organizational strategic plan. Um, you've gone through the ranks in a bit and now, uh, lead. What do you feel like is, has been the biggest lesson that you've learned over the past few years um, through this whole transitional process? It's a good question. I think the biggest lesson that I've learned is to learn how to separate myself and my experience from everyone else's. Um, I I, I think we all have a tendency, and I know I have a tendency to assume that everyone else perceives the world the way that I do. And I have really, um, and this really actually started in, in my career working in some multidisciplinary teams prior to CASA and hearing different expertise, hearing different professional experience, and, and just realizing that every single person comes to their decision or their recommendation based on so many different factors of their perception, their ability, where they're at in life, what their profession is, what their education has been, um, what their personal experience has been. And so I I think I've really been honing in on just working on honoring and and listening. I'm a talker. I could talk all day. Um, and (laughs) And I, I've really, it is. It is okay. And I do not mind talking, but I also have learned that not everybody likes to talk, but there are really valuable opinions from those that may not be speaking. And so really just trying to open up and be aware that in I truly, truly, truly believe that the multidisciplinary team model, the idea of coming around a table and everyone having an opportunity to take a shot at the problem and talk about it and share their their process for how they got to a solution leads to better solutions for communities as a whole, because no one person has the experience or the ideas that make this solution viable. And so if I'm leading an organization, I'm doing a disservice if I am just doing it the way that I think is best. So a big focus for me and, and working on like, going back to your question, did you ever think you'd be fired? No, I didn't. Um, I think sometimes I do uh, tend to maybe be overconfident or um, over, over, um, yeah, overconfident in my perception, my way that I perceive and, and see the world and realizing, you know, I might not be right and that's okay. And just learning to listen to others and allow that to influence my decisions, allow it to help shape where CASA is going. That's why we did the strategic planning process because if you're not talking to the people that you're working with, uh, how do you know we're really doing the work that we should? How do we know that our models are working? And so really learning to take my confidence in myself, because I think confidence is a really good thing, but realize that it doesn't have to be all on me. And I think that that's why a lot of people burn out because we oftentimes shoulder so much and think I can come up with a solution. I can do this all on my own. The reality is I don't have to. And I learned that really, really quickly coming into this role because being an executive director is a lot of work. And I have incredible board members with many expertise I don't have. I have staff with all sorts of lived experiences that I don't have. We have over 90 volunteers now with a 
diverse array of experience and background. And so to, to not listen to that and to not incorporate that into my thought process um, is a dis- disservice to the organization. And so I think that's been the biggest lesson that <laughs> transparently, I think is a lesson I, I, it's one of my circular lessons. I feel I get to learn it over and over and over. Um, but really in this last year, it's been just a good reminder that it, it does not have to be all on me. It's my job to keep track of all the pieces, but I don't have to be the only voice in the room, nor do I want to be. Well, that's interesting. Um, you know, with all the support that you you get internally, how do you feel supported as an executive director externally? That's a really good question. We have an incredible, incredible group of nonprofit leaders in this community. We have some incredible foundation leaders. And I have seen, actually, in each of the communities I work in, in very different aspects. Um, in Barry County, it's a smaller size, and they're really able to be close-knit and um there's a real intentional awareness of the needs of the community. And I'm seeing that same model grow in Ingham and in Eaton County. And so I sit on, in each of the communities, several different groups where executive leadership is coming together and saying, okay, these are the gaps in our community. These are the areas where we're having issues. How can we look at big picture solutions for this rather than all of us trying to solve the same problem siloed, which I think happens a lot in the nonprofit world. Um, because like it or not, we feel like it's a competition, but in reality, it shouldn't be because each of our nonprofits are serving different areas. They're serving different communities, even though there may be intersection. And if we can work together to make sure that we are using the resources in our community to the best of each of the nonprofits, I think we'll have bigger success overall. And I've learned so much from other leaders in our community. Heads up on, hey, this grant is dropping and I think it's a great opportunity for your organization. Or did you know that there's this training? I went to this two years ago and it was so beneficial for my leadership skills. And things like that, that really allow you to know not only peers and other leaders, but in your community that have experienced and have access to ideas, resources, whatever it may be, that we can just freely share. I think that that's been a really fun part of joining and and being a part of each of these communities. And I live in Ingham County, but I felt just as welcome in Barry County and Eaton County connecting in those spaces and getting to know people. It's been it's been a real pleasure just getting to know the communities and the leaders there and how they're all working potentially with different strategies, but to come together to solve problems rather than trying to solve them on our own. And so um, with that, what is, uh, hang on a sec. Let me back up. So um, just to continue on with, the fact that uh, that you're in you're in a larger community of nonprofit nonprofit leaders, and you're really making inroads with what Casa is doing, especially getting it out there as more of a public face. Is how do you want to leave your legacy with Casa? Ooh, you you were not kidding when you said you were going to give me some hard questions, Paul. <laughs> I mean, I know that it's it may feel like it's soon, but it's like, but you know, you obviously have seen the ins and outs of what this organization is, where it could potentially be, um, and so yeah, just a just a thought. What yeah. what, what would you like to see this organization go, reach? I think the simple sounding answer that is a very complicated solution um, would be, I would love to be able to win the lottery and leave CASA and know that it is going to thrive and perhaps even grow past me. I would like to leave a legacy that is in, in line with that idea of safety, stability, and permanency that I almost work myself out of a job 
set it up to a place where if I walk away, I know that the community, the team working there, the board, the volunteers, and the resources for the organization are going to um, outlast me. I think that that would be the legacy I would want to leave. And speaking of um, when you leave, when you leave the office, when you leave the office, or you unplug. Yes. What do you do to unplug? Well, I mean, what what do you, I mean, I know CASA is going to be in your system all the time, mm -hmm. but there has to be moments in which you're like, I'd rather do this right now, or just, yes. I need to get away for a second. What, what is that thing that you do? I am an avid reader. I have been since I was really young and I had discovered the boxcar children and the library cut me off because they gave you free ice cream cones. If you drink, if you read 10 books and after I turned in 10 ice cream cones within the first like two months, they were like, you're done for the summer politely. <laughs> Thank you. No more ice cream cones for you. Um, but I always have been, I, I love fantasy and uh, I love the opportunity to learn about other people, whether they be real or imagined. And uh, I think you just get a lot of a lot of new ideas and a new perspectives. So I've always loved reading. It's It's been a big, big part of my life, like I said, since I was very young. That's probably my number one way to unplug. And then secondary to that would be my dogs and cat. I um, They're a great motivator to get outside and take a walk and just um, decompress from from all of the aspects that come with human interaction. While it is so critical and beautiful and important, it is also exhausting, especially at this level. And so animals are a great way to decompress from that. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Rachel, for being on this, uh, this program, this podcast. Now, if anybody wants to learn more about who you are and what CASA is, what, what's a good place uh, or where could, where should they go? Yeah, we are on Facebook as CASA for Kids, Barry Eaton in Ingham County. And our website is www.casaforkidsinc.org. Those are the places where we always have the most update um, information. And thanks to our partnership with the street teams at MSU and some other local community members that have really given of their time, we are keeping those up to date and active and, and making sure we're getting the most information out to everyone. We also have a gala coming up in April. It'll be April 21st and tickets actually go on sale for that this week. Um, they will be opening up March 1st. And that's a really great way to get to know the organization, but in a, in a, in a fun way, it'll be a really fun night. There'll be food and, um, it'll be just an opportunity to learn more, hear from people who have worked with CASA or have been CASAs themselves or had a CASA and learn more about the overall organization. And then I'm always happy. I love doing coffee and you know, I, we talked a lot about being out in the community. So, uh, well, those are always great avenues, especially as we talked about. I think it's important to have an in-person connection and opportunity. So I love doing coffee and, and I also love doing community connections. I've actually been asked by a couple of businesses to just come in and present on a, a lunch meeting to talk about CASA. And I'm just always happy to talk, as I think we established today. <laughs> and so if, if the electronic way is not good for people, uh, you can shoot me an email and I'm happy to set up a time. Awesome. Well, thanks again for uh, taking some time and talking with me. I know I wasn't twisting your arm on that one. No. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. No, but it was always a pleasure. And thank you for creating a space for nonprofit conversations like that. I think it's really important and I'm um, glad to be here. Great. And thank you all again for taking some time to listen to Rachel and this podcast itself. And don't miss the next episode coming out in a couple of weeks. Now, if, if there's somebody that you want to know about or like to hear about their journey, please email us at missioncontrol at introduce.com. And if this is your first time, please subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcasting platform and leave us a positive review. Thank you again, and we'll see you next time in the Control Center.